Compañeros, socios, accionistas, somos un grupo de mega empresarios y políticos humildes que después de años de trabajar en las sombras, hoy cumplimos un sueño, el de lanzar el partido político Captura del Estado organizada. Prioridades, prioridades como la educación y la salud pública no son las nuestras. Lo importante es bajar los impuestos a las empresas, a nuestras multinacionales, asegurar importantes beneficios a los sectores privados y políticos con recursos públicos y desenmascarar, desenmascarar a aquellos que se niegan a ocultar su dinero en el extranjero. Para todo esto, a la sociedad le pedimos un esfuerzo, el esfuerzo de aumentar la pobreza y la desigualdad. Y muchos dirán, y muchos dirán que somos deshonestos, pero señores, yo les digo una cosa, deshonestos, sí, pero legales, por una élite, por una élite política y económica unida a los privilegios. ¡Viva el Partido Cero! Bueno, y ahí estábamos viendo un video para poner un poco en contexto esta, este nuevo segmento que vamos a estar arrancando. Mientras, los invito a que se vayan ubicando nuevamente en sus lugares, a que empecemos a hacer un poco de, de silencio también para poder escuchar a las dos disertantes que voy a invitar en breve a que se suban al escenario para hablar con este disparador, con este, de este video que veíamos y en la posibilidad de a debatir, a pensar, a reflexionar acerca de la construcción de un mundo de iguales. Bajo este título se da esta mesa que va a estar integrada, que ya le invito a que, a que se sume y a que se suba al escenario a Nada al Najif. Nada, te doy la bienvenida, welcome. Bienvenida. Y también a Winnie Villanima. Bienvenida, Winnie. Bueno, ellas van a mantener un diálogo, una conversación acerca de esta propuesta que es construir un mundo de iguales. En un ratito voy a estar volviendo para despedirlas y agradecerles por lo que nos van a prestar ahora. Muchas gracias. So, buenas tardes, Claxo. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to have a little exchange, Winnie and I, two women of the Global South. Winnie is a, well, I don't know if I can introduce her, but a parliamentarian, an activist, a leader on gender for a very long time, of women's empowerment. And I run the social and human sciences at UNESCO, and we're both delighted to be here. We're going to have a little conversation about inequalities. We're going to try to speak slowly so that you can all follow us. And let me start with a framework. I want to talk about Agenda 2030. This is the vision of the Sustainable Development Goals, a big agenda for the world that we are both working on. The agenda is anchored in human rights. It targets social justice outcomes. And most importantly, it promises to leave no one behind. And that's a promise that over 180 heads of state and government made when we launched this agenda. 
I want to talk very briefly about two aspects of this agenda and inequalities. First of all, inequalities, as we find out, it's a global phenomenon. Inequalities happen everywhere, within countries, across countries, across regions. And so they require global solutions. Those are some of the things that we've been working on. And we can only tackle inequalities in multi-sectoral ways. It is not appropriate that we work on the issues in a fragmented way. If we really want to talk about fighting exclusion, marginalization, vulnerability, we have to connect in order to address complex root causes. Oxfam has worked a lot on all of this. So let us hear from you. What challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Clark. So congratulations. This is so energizing. It's so good to come together. Activists, thinkers, students, to revitalize. So I'm grateful to be here. Leave no one behind. That is their promise. That is what our government signed on to. But from where I sit, I'm worried. I don't think we are moving in that direction of leaving no one behind. Why do I say that? Oxfam, we released a report this year. And in that report, we put some worrying statistics on the table. 47 people today, just 47, and may I say men, own as much wealth as half of humanity, 3.7 billion people at the bottom. Imagine, 47 people, just this line here maybe, owning as much wealth as 3.7 billion other people. We already also know that last year, last year, 87% of all new wealth created was captured by 1% at the top, 87% of all wealth, one half of humanity went away with nothing, zero new wealth. This is not the direction of leaving no one behind. Here in this region, this is the most, sadly, most unequal region in the whole world. In this region, the top 1% own 37% of all the wealth of this region, the top 1%. And in 2000, this figure was just 33%. Today it's 37% of all wealth, which shows you the trend. This is not the trend of no one left behind. This is the trend of a few running away with the wealth of this world. It's unacceptable. And we know why. We know why that is happening. If we don't find out why and fight to resolve it, this trend cannot stop. Why? Why is it so? Because our governments have chosen to take a direction of maximizing for GDP, what they call GDP, measuring growth of wealth rather than measuring what we value most in our lives, the health of our children, their education, their communities, the health of communities. This is not measured. Governments want to measure growth, and with that, they say we are moving forward. We know that's not the case. Companies, companies have been allowed a free ride the rich don't only use their money to buy art, to buy yachts. No, they use their money to buy laws, to make the laws work for themselves. They use their money to buy the media so that the rest of us cannot talk 
They are the only ones talking. They use their money to buy the courts, so they have impunity. So, with more money, more power, then more money, it's a cycle. We have to stop this. The only way to stop this is people power. We call this state capture at Oxfam. We have studied it. We have elaborated 11 ways in which the rich have captured fiscal policy in this region. Tomorrow, we will be having a whole day special forum to discuss this, to, to discuss state capture inequalities in this region. The solution is people power. I could come back to this, but let me turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Winnie. Those are very powerful facts, and I think we are committed as part of positive social transformation to changing uh, our context, not just the economics, but also understanding the politics, the social dimension, the cultural, uh, among a very complex system, as Winnie was saying. Um, some of the solutions come back to this community, the community of Claxo. It's very important to understand root causes, and root causes require research. There are many gaps in our understanding of how, really, the faces of these inequalities. We know it's about women um, being deprived of participation. We know it's about indigenous communities not having voice and not being able to participate. We know it's about vulnerability in general, the rural, the disabled, but we need to understand exactly where they are. If we're going to reach them, we must understand how they exist, what are the best tools, what are the mechanisms, and for that, we need better research. Research in numbers, the quantitative aspect is very important, when he mentioned some numbers, we have to keep in the advocacy hammering the numbers. But we also need to understand qualitatively what it is about this deprivation of rights, what it is that reduces us to existing without human dignity, and how we can truly empower. Uh, that's how we're going to do it. Like Winnie, we also have uh, a panel tomorrow on the right to science. Science is a big enabler. All of the sciences together, and we invite you to that. Science is a right. And the day after tomorrow, we have a bigger panel on inequalities also. And we invite you all to come and listen. Okay. Nada. Your organization works on... Um the social sciences and support the social sciences. It's true, are, it's very important that the people here help to unpack the causes for poverty and inequality. We try our best also at Oxfam. For example, we know for certain, and we have the evidence, that women's inequality is wired in this exploitative economic model. Women are at the bottom. The rich make their super, super wealth on the backs of poor women. They are at the very bottom. We know that violence against women is part of the economic model. It is not separate. You need to take them on together. This region, women earn 16% less than men, even though they are more qualified in here in Latin America. That's not an accident. It is negotiated in an economic model that exploits the weak, the vulnerable. So we think that the way 
to solve this lies in changing the politics, and I talked about people power. We have to organize, we have to fight, and people in Latin America, you know this the best. You have led movements that have transformed your region. This movement building, this organizing must happen to challenge the economic model and the business model that goes with it. But secondly, we also need to tackle the global rules because the capitalist system is wired globally. It's not within national borders. The rich have gone and written global rules that make it easy for them to cheat the rest of us. Take the tax rules. UNCTAD put out a, a study showing that the big companies every year cheat through one method of tax dodging, not all the tax dodging, just one of a hundred or so methods of routing money through tax havens. We are cheated $100 billion every year from our developing countries. This is money that could put 124 million children in school. I'm talking about the SDGs. This is money that could save the lives of six million children. But this money is lost because they have a system of tax dodging up from one country to another to another. So unless we change rules like that, there is not going to be everyone left, everyone not left behind. The third, so the rules of taxation, the rules of intellectual property, many global rules have been fixed to keep the poor poor and to give a few owners of capital and technology to run away. I won't even go in the question of technology and these huge monopolies that are here now running amok because they are not regulated. That's a challenge. But the third one, the third area, is that of culture and social norms. The, the informal rules of society. This is the battleground, especially for women's rights. Because it is those informal rules that justify capitalist exploitation. You know, I once saw a report of the Asian Development Bank. It was shameful. It was saying that it was not the report the bank saying, but it was quoting a capitalist, an owner of a company, saying that they want to hire women because women are generally docile, do not go on strike. That was a reason given in a report for why the company is hiring more and more women, because they don't fight for their right to unionize. So capitalist exploitation, gender inequality tied together through social norms. They take advantage of the social, the patriarchal attitudes in society. So fighting patriarchy, fighting beliefs, traditions, social rules that justify inequality, subordination of women, violence against women, that's a battleground. Again, you Latin American people, I stand here in respect for you because my years in the women's movement, I saw that Latin American women were leading the world on fighting on this issue of controlling women's bodies, women owning and controlling their bodies. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are not there yet, but you Latin American people, you are putting the cracks in the wall. You are fighting hard and the rest of us will gain from your hard efforts. 
So power to you on that. Yeah. Let, let, let me hand to, my, to Nada here. Nada knows this from evidence of social science research. <laughs> and I, I want to close because we have to stop uh, with a reminder we celebrate this year 70 years of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. Absolutely. And this is the time again where the core values that we fought for all those times, justice, accountability, equality, voice, and participation must be taken back. I think this is the struggle that we're all involved in. And I want to close with a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, a little bit out of context, but she was one of the main authors of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And she reminded us that that work of human rights begins in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. So let's go to work and keep it up. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And